Hafede and good afternoon, or good morning, I'm sorry. Hafede and good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today for a briefing with Governor Leon Guerrero on her recent federal mission. Before we begin, I'll go ahead and go through uh, the, her itinerary prior to giving her the floor. So on January 26, Governor Leon Guerrero was in San Francisco where she met with Bonnie Preston, Acting Regional Director for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Region 9, as well as Matt Johns, Regional Health Administrator to discuss COVID-19 issues and other related HHS partnerships with our island. That same day, Governor Leon Guerrero also met with Pete Weldy, Administration of Children and Families to discuss child welfare priorities. She also met with CMS Division's lead, Division Leads Sharon Yee and Tom Duran, and Emily Williams from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. From January 29th through January 31st, Governor Leongro was in DC, where she participated in the National Governors Association Winter Meeting. On the final day of the NGA winter meeting, governors met with President Biden and Vice President Harris. This meeting also included key agency leaders from the U.S. Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Agriculture, the National Economic Council, the U.S. Department of Treasury, and the U.S. Department of Education. Governors also had the opportunity to have a luncheon with the Secretary of the Department of Transportation. Uh, while in DC, our governor interviewed with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I provided that interview to you in its entirety last week. That video is available online. On February 1st, Governor Leon Guerrero provided testimony to the Interagency Group on Insular Affairs, followed by testimony before the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, where she joined fellow U.S. territories to provide the state of the U.S. territories. Again, I provided those testimonies to you and the available media links last week, uh, immediately following her testimony. Lastly, on February 2nd, Governor Leon Guerrero met with the Assistant Secretary for Economic Development, Alejandro Castilla, Tanya Bradshaw, Chief of Staff to Secretary Dennis McDonough, Department of Veterans Affairs, Willie Clark, Deputy Undersecretary for Fields Operation, Matt Quinn, Undersecretary of Memorial Affairs, Rima Nelson, Assistant Secretary for Health, and Health for Operations, Rafael Chavez Fernandez, Deputy Assistant Secretary for the IGIA, IGIA, Vivian Hudson, Senior Advisor for Pacific Strategy, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Installations, Energy and Facilities, James Balaki, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Dr. Kathleen Hicks at the Pentagon. And last but not least, she met with Hawaii Senator Mazi Hirono. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and give the floor to Governor Leon Guerrero and I'll provide this right up to you as well in the chat. So Governor. Thank you very much, Crystal. Um, and thank you everybody for um, this opportunity to, to debrief about uh, my trip to um, San Francisco and also to DC. And um, uh, as you can tell, it was a very busy schedule. Um, first off, as Crystal had said, we started off in uh, Region 9, where I met with uh, Bonnie Preston, who was the acting director of HHS, along with uh, key people to discuss uh, supplies issues with COVID and to discuss uh, increasing um, medications uh, to Guam. Testing, as you know, uh, is a concern, testing kits here. And um, they have uh, committed to making sure that they provide the support and the resources. And they have been very responsive. Um, I'm able to just pick up the phone and talk to Bonnie and uh, have her help us out with some of the uh, transport and the allocations. I also met with uh, Pete uh, Witte and he's with child care. Um, that was a very good meeting also because as you know, we are standing up a uh, new division in public health called Child Wellness Program. And uh, one of the uh, purpose there is to provide resources and services to our child care providers, to our child care um, entities, and to make sure that we push out 
the child care grants that are available through this division. And uh, Pete was very uh, impressed by the fact that we are restructuring and reorganizing so we can uh, better provide and better be accessible uh, to child care providers, to the mothers, and to provide them with the resources that they need to provide quality services for our children. Um, as you know, uh, President Biden and also uh, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden uh, is focusing very much uh, as their priority is child care wellness. Additionally, with Emily uh, Williams there, she's the head of SAMHSA and uh, relate to me her, um, her satisfaction and uh, her uh, assessment of how well our behavioral health clinic has um, been uh, supported and be solidified and also been enhanced to again, uh, reach out to our community to help with our uh, mental health issues, uh, drug addiction, suicide, uh, and so forth. And she's a very key partner in uh, the improvement of those services here for our people. Very um, well connected to uh, Therese Ariola, and she's actually very on top of how we are dealing with our mental health issues here. And again, all of them offered their um, assistance in any way and uh, look forward to coming over to Guam to visit our island and so that we can, uh, so that they can see firsthand um, the challenges maybe, and also the uh, successes that we have made, not just through uh, childcare, but also through um, our behavioral health and wellness program. And then flew over to um, DC where we had our National Governors Association, which is um, usually an annual meeting where all the governors from the 50 uh, states and also from the territories and Puerto Rico come and meet together to uh, discuss issues, uh, to discuss trends, to discuss what's going on for the future and also to uh, get updates about uh, the major priorities, primarily uh, COVID-19 infrastructure bill, the ARP and how we are using that. Also learning from the other governors what best practices they have um, uh, applied so that we can only better improve um, the services here. Uh, the major takeaway from that is that um, digitalization and technology is the way. That's the future leap. And uh, these are things that we need to consider to prepare to make sure we take the opportunity to exhaust that um, opportunity. So uh, one of the things that our chair and president had is an initiative of computer science and uh, has asked states to look into possibilities of having computer science curriculum from K through 12. Uh, there were three major CEOs that were there. Um, that uh, talked about technology and talked about how they applied it uh, in their business and how they see that this is uh, the way to really doing business, uh, but made this, made this uh, position that in order for us to prepare, we really need to look at our high school and our kindergarten and our middle school, and we need to look at our curriculum and how are we preparing our children to take advantage of this future endeavors. Um, talked a lot about basic skills that needed to be incorporated in the schools are uh, digital and analytics, critical thinking, uh, creative thinking, writing and basic communications. Um, we also had the opportunity to meet with uh, the Secretary of Transportation, uh, Pete Budicek, and uh, he talked about what's coming down through the infrastructure bill. The main takeaway there is flexibility of use of the funds and that uh, this infrastructure bill enhances already about 395 existing programs that deal with utilities, deal with cybersecurity, deal with climate change, and, uh, and not only 
existing programs that are being enhanced and also um, uh, new programs. There's about maybe 275 new programs as a result of the infrastructure. There are competitive grants that are putting, being put forward, but there's a lot of opportunities there for our island to take to, uh, again, improve transportation. And energy is another issue that they talked about. And their target there is uh, electrical vehicles. And as you, as you follow the news and you follow uh, the direction of this, you'll see that Michigan State uh, now has um, GM plants throughout their state to produce electrical vehicles. I know President uh, Biden is very keen on the future of states and territories uh, using electrical vehicles. I also, made the uh, I also made the argument that Guam would be a great place to have demonstration projects for the success of electrical vehicles. And I'll continue to make that case because that would be an opportunity for us to uh, provide more jobs and not only that, uh, not have to uh, spend a lot of our income uh, towards gas. And uh, one, of, one of my takeaway there is to work very closely with our uh, Department of Public Works to um, buy and purchase electrical buses. Uh, and that could be a start of our way to incorporate electrical vehicles here on our island. One of the biggest uh, challenges they talked about also in relation to transportation is um, the shortage of uh, semiconductors and the shortage of these chips. And that's why uh, there's a uh, shortage of cars being produced. And um, they are looking to uh, address that in some way to make sure that uh, they can produce more of these chips so the production of cars uh, move forward. Um, then after that, we also heard from Mitch Landro, and Mitch Landro is the special assistant to the, to the president, and his job is truly just uh, to coordinate the infrastructure monies and to implement the infrastructure bill. And a uh, suggestion was made to the states and the territories that one of the things we should probably do is create an infrastructure task force and have the chair of that task force be the infrastructure coordinator. And as I read through more about the infrastructure bill and as I talk more with the governors, um, it really is a needed position because there's just so many programs and so many grants and so many uh, funding sources in this infrastructure bill. And I wanna make sure we uh, take advantage of every uh, funding source that we can to bring it to our island, to improve our transportation, to provide the uh, utilities infrastructure, to enhance infrastructure in underserved areas and uh, to, again, contain and maintain and protect the quality of our waters. Cybersecurity is another big um, use of these funds. And one of my um, initiatives is to automate uh, our government. And certainly this is going to be a source of funding that we could we could use to make that happen. We all know the benefits of automation. It provides uh, efficiency, expediency, and uh, all, allow, all around better uh, services to our people. Um, then after this, what we did was we met with the president and the vice president in a meeting of just the states and the territories that governors that were there uh, and um, key cabinet members. And again, there was uh, Jeff Zines there who is the head person that oversees COVID, um, the, the COVID um, pandemic uh, issue and is the special assistant to the president. And so we were able to present our the state of affairs with our COVID 
Um, and one of the doctors that made a presentation also did talk about Omicron 0.2 variant and that they're seeing some of that, but it's not as severe as Omicron. And he feels the effect of that would be maybe, ju maybe just at the tail end of the infection. Um, and then uh, the, for our purpose, the, the uh, director or the secretary of agriculture, Tom Vilasic was there and he talked about um, what kinds of uh, programs that the um, secretary or the department of agriculture is uh, moving forward. Uh, a lot of help to farmers, a lot of help to uh, home uh, grown owners. I did ask him about aquaculture and they are doing a lot of research in agriculture, aquaculture, in which he also uh, advised that I should uh, hook up with the New York University because they're doing a lot of um, research and development about aquaculture. And I certainly will do this uh, through GITA and through our aquaculture task force. Um, after that, we also then I was I had the uh, opportunity to attend the interagency governmental interagency meetings that is hosted by our oversight uh, of the Department of uh, Interior and the Secretary of Interior was there. Um, the uh, secretary uh, or the uh, director of intergovernmental agency, uh, Julie uh, Rodriguez was there. And there's, there was Gretchen there who is specifically hired to um, be more involved in Puerto Rico and the territories and uh, reports directly to Julie Rodriguez who then reports to the president. Um, there were also, of course, the um, key agencies that made presentation, EPA, transportation, energy was there. Um, but my takeaway from that is um, there are a lot of programs and grants. Again, um, they also uh, um, informed us of certain grants that are particular to our island. And um, um, some funds through EPA that we could use for uh, funding electrical vehicles for buses. Uh, but the overall um, purpose and agenda for that meeting is, as you know, with the new administration, they want to listen and hear more about uh, what the status of this, the governor, the, uh, the territories, are and what it is that uh, we need for us to uh, be uh, supported. Of course, every opportunity I had, I presented my argument about the need for a hospital and to make and to um, provide funding for that for that hospital. Um, then we went and testified. I went and testified in front of the Senate Committee on um, Natural Resources, chaired by Senator Manchin, um, and uh, talked again about the status of um, our island. My present, my testimony. Probably you do have a copy of it, but um, made the case for support for the new hospital. We talked about uh, the tourism decline and the importance of helping uh, our recovery for tourism, and then also about the workforce, is specifically H two B visa situation, uh, Medicaid, as you know. Um, is going to our our Medicaid um, sources of funds right now is pretty good. Uh, we are, I think, uh, eighty three percent matching, um, eighty three seventeen matching, and uh, they have increased our cap, but that's going to end soon. And so again, uh, not just for Guam, but everywhere everywhere else in the territories. And so. Um, we are asking again to be um, removed from the cap and to be calculated, uh, our FMAP calculated based on uh, per capita income. 
uh, mention also our situation with compact impact and again made the um, made the uh, argument to be a participant in the negotiations of the compact impact uh, and then um, also uh, talked about our need to uh, self-determination and to allow us uh, through maybe uh, legislation to articulate our desired political status. Um, there is also, as you know, um, Senate Bill 2798, and this has to do with the RICA situation. And I asked for their support in reconsidering uh, that as Guam become uh, can become an eligible benefactor for uh, RICA. And of course, I ask that they reconsider their uh, decision on Build Back Better, as there's a lot of uh, good benefits, humanitarian benefits for our island. Um, then after that, I had some uh, meetings also, as, as Crystal had mentioned, with uh, the, the veterans. Uh, and when I met with the veterans, my um, my uh, position there or my uh, information there had to deal with our uh, cemetery, veterans cemetery needing uh, to be expanded because we are running out of um, um, space and also uh, uh, approach them about the possibility of having a regional benefits service center here in Guam uh, to directly uh, take uh, applications and claims, and not only for Guam uh, veterans, but also for CNMI and uh, the other island, uh, sovereign island nations, uh, as there are veterans out there that need to be serviced, including veterans from the Philippines. Um, and then I uh, proceeded to inform them about my um, vision for the medical complex center and to um, help in any way uh, so that we can stand up a veterans clinic in that medical uh, complex. Um, uh, other people that we've met, again, when I speak to them, I bring up the same kind of uh, issues unless there's specific ones that I needed to talk about. And of course, one of them was the Eagle Field when I uh, had a meeting with uh, Vice Admiral Joe Hill, who's in charge of um, uh, the mi missile defense um, issues and infrastructure in this part of the, the Pacific. And uh, he has assured me that the commitment of the Secretary of the Navy for land uh, in the Eagles Field area still is uh, being honored and uh, will we will move forward then with the um, we will move forward then with the lease negotiations, which I understand uh, started this week, uh, started back again this week. Uh, when I did also meet with Mr. Balaco, uh, Balaki, he uh, with MDA with the Missile Defense um, Agency, he also assured me that there is no risk in the uh, land that was committed uh, for our uh, use as the medical, um, as the medical uh, complex. Uh, in transportation, I talked about uh, airport and the need for more revenues sources from the federal and there are, there are sources from the federal uh, agencies and so, uh, Ricky Hernandez and John Kanata are on top of that. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about CSIS. Maybe you'll just ask me questions about that because you do already have the um, you do already have the interview and you look through there. Um, I think I'll end it there. If there are any questions that uh, you want to ask me. Um, I'd be more than happy to take them. Uh, thank you, Governor. I know we had a long, you had a long list of uh, topics that you covered. I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to our media questions. 
uh, just to let you know, it'll be two questions per round, and we'll go ahead and exhaust all your questions, starting with Nestor Lacanto, KUAN. Thanks, Chris. Safaday, Governor. Welcome back. Yeah, a lot of luck. Thanks, Nestor. Yeah, a lot to unpack here. Uh, let me just start with, you mentioned the uh, Eagles Field. Uh, so yeah. that, uh, you said, is now back on the table. Does that mean that um, it's no longer going to be under consideration by the Missile Defense Agency? Right. They are honoring that. A uh, piece of property for the medical complex, and uh, Vice Admiral uh, Joe Hill did say that that is not being looked at or uh, for MDA for Mr. So when you say, so when you say the it's, lease negotiations are underway, that means a lease, uh, the fifty-year lease for the property. That's uh, and it's no longer the license. You're talking about a lease, right? We had a license. We have a license, and I think it's good for two years. Uh, and that license, Nestor, is just to allow us to be able to go into the property and make our assessments and, you know, um, evaluate the property, the property and so forth. Uh, and then um, uh, the, the uh, end goal here is to have a lease uh, agreement between, of course, the um, Department of uh, I don't know if it's Department of Defense or the Secretary, it might be the, the Secretary of the Navy uh, and uh, for the use of that property for a medical complex. And, you know, the negotiations have just started, um, but our ask is to uh, have the lease for 99 years. All right, uh, another topic um, you mentioned, the Secretary- can I just, can I, Yeah, can sure. I just add a little bit here, Nestor? Sure. Um, the, the, um, the military, the secretary, not the secretary of the Navy, but the Navy has said to me um, and through Admiral Nicholson and also through uh, MDA that the property that MDA is looking at is is uh, adjacent to our medical complex carve out, right? Um, however, they're making surveys and if they're, if they're, they're looking at if they are going to place anything it would it would probably be a radar communication station but they're going to make first uh, an assessment of how that's going to impact the airport and how that's impact uh, the medical complex but I also want to point out that this whole uh, issue with MDA is a beginning it's a survey they they have not yet had uh, the appropriations to move to uh, uh, develop an MDA, I uh, sorry, a missile defense system. They, they haven't even decided of what that system is. So as you as you know, it'll be far down um, uh, years before anything actually does uh, happen. Um, you know, this is this is their thinking, um, and and uh, also that this property that. Uh, is still this property is still in the federal assets inventory and it was never uh, it was never listed in the net negative list as an excess property so um, I just want to make it very clear and they did say that if we did not build a medical complex there it would return back to the federal government all right, th thanks for the clarification. Uh, on another topic, I just wanted to follow up on what Secretary uh, Buttigieg had uh, recommended that um, states and territories set up an infrastructure uh, task force. Um, when will you be doing that and will it be comprised of both public and private members? Um, the, infra the infrastructure committee, I'm already uh, establishing um, that committee. And we're also already looking at who would be a good infrastructure coordinator. Um, it would be government agencies. Um, and uh, uh, I don't, we haven't yet talked about private involvement, but I, I, I think if we did have private involvement, they would be probably be around technology and utilities and uh, issues with climate change, yeah. Yeah, because I imagine that we're going to rely heavily on these uh, infrastructure funding to help uh, prop up the uh, uh, economy going into the next few years. Yeah. Yes, and and the uh, practice that is being uh, uh, advised out there is to enter into PPP agreements to uh, push the money out. Right. So uh, 
of course, with cybersecurity and broadband and so forth, uh, and also climate change and energy, those are some prime opportunities for PPPs. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll defer to the next round. Okay. Thank you, Nestor. Polly Suba. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I wanted to talk about now that it's been practically two years uh, when you made news about uh, partnering with the U.S. Navy and allowing the um, Theodore Roosevelt to come to Guam or to to moor up and allow these uh, these sailors that had COVID to come into the hotels. How much leverage now do you have when you made that decision? How much leverage now? How much weight? do you have now uh, talking with, uh, with, with federal officials like the Senate? Um, I think we still have a lot of leverage uh, to use with that. Um, and uh, and, and uh, certainly with the Pentagon, um, the leverage is still very strong there and certainly with Indo-PACOM, yeah. Understood. Uh, I guess we can also go back to when you were talking about the child wellness program. What what is it that you envision? Uh, is it something like a an entire agency that somebody can walk into, file uh, uh, a yeah. program, and then and then take that application to yeah. any child child care facility? Um the 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 vision that I had, which we already did through executive order, um, Polly, is we took a child, I think it was just child care division, uh, not division, but it was uh, it, it was BOSA and also another division of child child uh, public services. And we took that and made a division of child wellness, which would include um, Child Protective Services, it would include child, child care providers, it would include regulatory issues, it would include, um, I think, nutrition for children. So it's an overall encompassing division in anything that has to do with child and child wellness. And uh, it would be, uh, I envision it also as a place where uh, if, if mothers needed some help with child, child uh, um, or, or uh, uh, public services, that they would also be able to come to this division and uh, to be helped. But more importantly, we wanted to also make sure that the grants that we are getting from uh, the federal government is utilized and is pushed out appropriately and expediently to help uh, mothers with child care issues uh, to help child care providers uh, continue on with their businesses as we had already pushed out about close to $18 million to child care uh, providers so that they can con con continue on with their operations. So right now we have 43 uh, registered providers and we had given them about $400,000 each to continue on with their operations to provide services to uh, our people and uh, our families so that they can continue uh, to be able to work and provide a better, a better uh, family life. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about your uh, visit or testimony before the Senate. Uh, the second thing on the topic after support for the new public hospital was uh, tourism decline and uh, basically asking the Senate to, to work on some kind of relief plan for tourism. Uh, did you get any response back, any positive response back to help out our tourism industry? Not so specifically um, in their questions, uh, but they did send me more questions um, to answer. So it's on their radar through this testimony and, I, and every uh, governor in the territories supported that. The US uh, Virgin Islands, of course, is very much uh, dependent on tourism and theirs is more cruise ships and cruise lines. Uh, CNMI is very dependent uh, on tourism, just as we are, and of course, Puerto Rico. Um, and then American Samoa was there virtually and, um, and was also supportive of it. I might have a couple more questions. Polly, I'm Polly, not sure are we allowed to go around again? 
Polly, I'll come back for another round. Let's defer to awesome. your colleagues. Yes. Maureen Martita, Mariana's Business Journal. Buenas, Governor. Hi, Maureen. So, I wanted to ask um, about insurance, both at the uh, federal and local level. So um, <clears throat> I believe you raised um, SSI um, uh, as one of the areas where Guam could get help with the um, with the Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Do you expect that to be one of the things that is um, successful um, I, and that we will get that? You know, I think it, 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 I expect it to be. Um, of course, SSI was part of the uh, Build Back Better bill, um, but we did also ask to carve out uh, some of these issues for us to be able to uh, benefit from. And I think there's more evidence and more, you know, um, th that support the importance of having SSI uh, in, in the territories. And especially uh, if all the congressional delegates uh, in a united voice push for that. Okay. Um, and then on the... Um on the local level, if I can put it like that. Are you still looking at um, unemployment insurance? And if so, we, where would the funding come from? Would that be from uh, private sector businesses? Well, we're, we are, you know, exploring all, uh, all options, uh, Maureen. Uh, but I am, you know, this pandemic has really just shown to us the importance of unemployment insurance. You know, this time around, it's pandemic. We don't know what else down the road that can happen to, again, uh, disrupt our economy and have a huge unemployment uh, situation. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, trust funds. We're looking at ways that we can maybe uh, the government can subsidize it, uh, and maybe there might be partnership with private sector and public sector to um, subsidize. You know, there's, we're not right now at the stage of just uh, making a decision on how it's going to be funded, but we are in discussions with, uh, with Department of Labor also and some um, key people in our team. Okay, thank you. I'll be back to the second round. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Heidi Iwanyo Gilbert, Post Guam. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back, Governor. Um, Hi, Heidi. My first question um, You said you met with President Biden. Uh, did he mention about any visit to Guam since he will be in this area uh, in the spring? And uh, what? how did that conversation go? If no, a... there was no mention about coming to Guam or uh, stopping by in his visit during the spring, but certainly um, I can write a letter and invite him and work through our White House um, uh, connections and see if he'll stop by. Yeah. Okay, Governor, um, you mentioned a meeting with public health officials while you were in DC, I mean, in um, uh, San Francisco. Right. So do we now have a stable uh, supply of COVID-19 test kits uh, so and we, treatments? And when do you expect to lift the rationing of COVID-19 testing? So right now um, we are working, as you know, the federal government doesn't give us tests right out now. Um, it has moved to vendors and direct purchases from the manufacturers. And we are in the process of working that relationship with vendors, uh, local vendors here. And we are starting to get more uh, supplies, but we, we will probably continue on with testing positive, uh, no, testing uh, symptomatic uh, patients or those individuals who have had contact who are very immunodepressed and vulnerable populations. So we're doing a target population in terms of testing. We are continuing to do that right now 
being much more uh, selective and prioritizing so we can be able to really uh, reach out to the people that uh, do need to have those testing. So uh, once we get uh, more, and we are getting more, um, uh, I just had a meeting this morning and I was informed that we'll be getting uh, more tests. Uh, and so once we are comfortable with the amount that we can then uh, be able to um, provide it um, throughout. So, Governor, in short, uh, that's not going to happen this week, even though we have no. uh, additional test kits. Okay. And, Governor, no. I mean, what you see, if you see our numbers, Heidi, we're still testing about close to 1,200, 1,000 a day. Yeah. Governor, uh, since we're on the topic of COVID-19, uh, at what point will you lift the vaccine mandate? Vaccine mandate? Um, I think I will continue the vaccine mandate because it's through vaccinations that we can trans transition to normalcy. Uh, and so I'm really trying to get to that level of where we are able to say, uh, hey, you know, um, we're, we are much more protected and we are safer to be able to uh, get back to some normalcy. Um, but as far as vaccine mandates, we will continue on. And we will also aggressively, again, work uh, to boosting people because our boosting, I think our boosting rate is only, percentage is only like 54%, so. Thank you, Heidi. We'll come back around for your follow-up questions. Joseph Titano, Pacific Daily News. Good morning, Governor. Welcome home. Thanks, Joseph. And, uh, you know, you mentioned um, some possibilities for uh, electric vehicles. Um, is, did you say that uh, DPW is looking to get um, some electric buses? Or are we going to be uh, looking into we that? Are, we are looking into that very closely. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's it'll be a less less difficult for uh, the buses, right? Because we could just set up a charging station right there in DPW. And uh, I've been talking to Vince, and I'm uh, wanting to get at least fifty of the electrical vehicles and um, for the buses. Uh, and this was when I presented this to our interagency government meeting, um, the uh, representative that was presenting from the secretary, from the secretary of environmental uh, protection agency uh, informed me that there are funds with EPA that we can use to purchase these buses. And so we are going to connect with him also. So I think it'll be, be. I think it'll be really great. It, it, you know, it decreases it, it, your your cost for gas is zero. Your maintenance is zero. When I was back there, uh, two meet two conferences ago when I was in Annapolis, um, I drove an electrical truck, and I asked the guy, "What's the maintenance?" And he just told me, uh, "Just make sure the tires have air." So. Can you imagine having that? I would love to have that. At least try, right? Let's 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 move and do it and and see what see how the benefit is. I think the benefit's going to be very positive. Kids won't have to be smelling the fumes of the gas. Right, and uh, so school buses. It sounds like, and is the money there for those fifty buses? The electrification center. I'm telling and you, they told me that. that Joe, Joseph, they told me they have it. And so I am going to go get those monies. Right, understood. Thank you, <laughs> we'll come back around for you. Uh, Aurora Khan, Pacific Island Times. Hello, Governor. Thank you for the briefing. Um, I just have a question regarding the H2B. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, requested for uh, the, the exemption to be extended and yes. also for the for them to allow uh, or to recognize the qualified other qualified need as determined by yourself. So I just wanted to find out uh, if there was any positive response uh, towards those requests. 
not specifically again during the Senate hearing, but uh, they have asked me some follow-up questions about the H-2B visa. Um, one of the things uh, that I do when I go there too is work with the agencies that can make this happen. And uh, we have been in communications with the immigration services and the Homeland Security and, and also the military. And they know very much uh, the issues. And actually I am told by the Department of Labor that, that our Department of Labor has been working very closely with immigration and Homeland Security to develop a process here that could uh, make it uh, faster and able to use these uh, H2B workers, not just for military, but for civilian projects, yeah. Well, thank you for that, Governor. Um, I also have a question regarding the infrastructure funds that are available under the, um, the infrastructure bill. You mentioned that there's uh, grants uh, that could help with uh, climate and other things. I was wondering, uh, would there be funds available for, uh, let's say, because the, the price of uh, power, you know, for, for uh, consumers have gone up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's a difficulty for a lot of people to be able to meet their obligations as far as this is concerned. Is there any uh, possibility of a program that could help alleviate, you know, yeah. the, 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 the rise in the power cost? Right. So the rise in power costs um, uh, programs probably would be those that uh, deal with alternative energy. And that's why electrical vehicles have been made a targeted priority um, in, the, in, in, in the states and also for here in our island. Um, as, you can, as you can see, if you have an electrical vehicle, or you don't have to buy gas. And gas right now is $5.17 and maybe more a gallon. So that would be one way to alleviate uh, cost for our people. But also we have a current program going on through the Department of Administration. It's the ERA program. And that program helps our, uh, our island and our residents in terms of their utility costs. So that's already an ongoing program. And as far as is there any direct uh, funds that can be given to people for their utilities, um, that program is available, but I'll have to look at the infrastructure bill to see if there's specifically uh, a mention of that, because when they talk about utilities, they talk of infrastructure uh, utilities, you know, uh, how do you provide more transmission distribution and how do you provide more generation of energy uh, through infrastructure uh, systems and programs. I see. Thank you very much, Governor. You're welcome. Thank you, Aurora. We're coming back around. Nestor from KUAM, any follow up questions? Yes, thanks, Chris. Uh, if I, we can segue to uh, the budget uh, discussions, uh, the FY23 budget proposal is. Um, been sent over to the legislature and those dis, um, budget talks will start soon. Um, so you're proposing a slight increase of I think 60 to 70 million over the current year for fiscal year 23. Um, we had Lester Carlson on our air yesterday. He sounded very optimistic. Um, and despite, uh, you know, the tourism slump and the end of the uh, uh, PUA and federal assistance programs. Why, why are you optimistic? I'm, we're, I'm optimistic because the numbers show it, you know, um, and in every category, we're, we're collecting above what was uh, budgeted uh, or what was adopted in fiscal year 20, uh, uh, 2021 or even fiscal year 2022, we can see that our collections um, supersede what our uh, revenue, adopted revenues are. And so that's one uh, reason of the optimism, Nestor. Um, and also that also shows that there's some recovery and, and strength in our economy happening. Uh, as you know, construction is one of the uh, much more successful uh, industry here. And, uh, and also we are seeing a lot more of military spending 
in our island, which is uh, going back into our economy and can be seen through the numbers uh, of the various line items of our revenue, um, revenue items. Uh, and also, uh, it can also be seen by the fact that we have retired our $83 million deficit, and that can only be done if we had uh, more revenues that are collected than there is adopted. So uh, that's where the optimism is. And also I'm optimistic <clears throat> that we are probably in the last stages of this pandemic. And I'm optimistic that the um, tourist uh, uh, industry will recover. Um, it has, it had, I'm, I'm told through the airport that we have started to see more arrivals uh, before Omicron. And then now uh, that sort of uh, impacted uh, a bit with our arrivals, but uh, I'm optimistic we'll start seeing an increase in our arrivals also. Uh, the airport says they see uh, planes coming in from Hawaii and, you know, the West stateside uh, full. Um, of course, planes from Narita and so forth aren't as uh, uh, full, but I expect that to uh, start happening maybe by the end of this year, early next year. Thank you, Governor. You, you mentioned revenues in excess of uh, projections. I think uh, fiscal year 21, um, GovGuam had uh, about 60 million. And uh, Lester said um, you're tracking about 47 46. million. Yeah, 46 million as, as of the end of January. And these, these you, can, you can have access to this because we reported out uh, to the legislature, yeah. So I guess the, the question is, um, why not return some of the, the revenue in excess of projections back to local businesses through a rollback of the BPT? Because that's what they've been asking for. Yeah, um, we're, we, you know, we are looking at that. We're not looking at returning it right back, but, you know, as our numbers stabilize, um, you know, that's a discussion that has not, you know, I'm not closed to that uh, situation, Nestor. Uh, you know, if there's any way we can help more our small businesses, we will. And uh, as you can see, we we established the LEAP program that we are now, we've now helped about 900 uh, small businesses in that program. And, uh, you know, I will probably add more to it because uh, we're seeing uh, more need to it. So. I just want people to know that I'm not adverse at all uh, in working with the small businesses and I have worked with the small businesses. Um, and uh, once we see our revenues and I can say that our revenues that we're seeing is really making up for the possibility of decreasing the GRT taxes, um, you know, we'll certainly look at that. Uh, the other good thing, Nestor, as you know, is the, the we don't, we are in the future, we're not going to be spending 60 million for the EITC. So that's going to help out also in the strength of our revenues. Um, of course, you know, we have to make sure we have enough for debt service and we have enough for uh, possible capital improvement projects moving forward. Uh, but I just want people to know that I'm very uh, open-minded about situations like that. Um, I also, uh, I'm very thankful for the small business people uh, for the help that they've done with, with the government in being cooperative with our vaccine program and our mask mandates to help protect and save the lives of our people so that they can also have their businesses successful and we can have a quicker economic recovery. So is there a specific trigger point where you would say it's time to roll it back to 4%? No, we haven't, no, we haven't uh, talked about a specific trigger point. All right, thank you, Governor. Thank you, Ness. Holly Suba, PNC. 
And uh, Governor, you and the Lieutenant Governor unveiled the investment pad of Hamzu back in November. And even if the Build Back Better bill doesn't pass, it doesn't look like it's going to pass as it as uh, as its original form. You still sound very optimistic that uh, with the ARP funds and some of the Defense Department funds um, and funds from the Department of Interior is going to be able to help provide. Uh, these same programs with investment Patahamzu, is that correct? Yes, um, certainly healthcare, education, and public safety are very key uh, in our uh, investment Patahamzu in terms of and our economic recovery uh, plans, helping out our small businesses. Uh, uh, and don't forget also, probably the uh, infrastructure bill. There's like, you know, I, I think there's like, two or three trillion in that package. So that's also a source. Also, we get a, quite a few uh, veterans calling in. We have our own vet talk as well. And they, they continue to talk, advocate for um, revitalizing the veteran cemetery. And then you were talking about how you met with some people about um, expanding yeah. the veteran cemetery. Can you give us more details? Yeah, you know what, they were very, um, they were very supportive of it. And uh, we talked about grants and we talked about, um, there's, there was a guy there named Quinn. His last name is Quinn. And he's been in communication with uh, Tim Uggen about the cemetery. And he's very uh, optimistic that uh, our grants may be approved. And if it does, well, we, we are going to make sure our the cemetery of our veterans is going to be uh, revitalized and rehabilitated. Absolutely. The congressman talked about uh, working with or possibly uh, turning it into like a like a battle memorial and whatnot. Have you heard of this option, if that's feasible? No, I have not heard of that option. Uh, I don't know exactly what a battlefront, what was it, battlefront? It would be like the, uh, it's like a battle memorial because of all that has happened here in Guam, World War II, and uh, the planes, bombers leaving Guam to uh, Vietnam and whatnot to possibly, almost like, I liken it to like the Arlington Cemetery, like it's a tourism uh, people would go there and pay their respects and whatnot, uh, even, you know, like the um, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and possibly getting funds uh, to the local veterans cemetery to put up something like that. Like um, the congressman said punch bowl also. He, he likened it to punch bowl. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, if that's, if that's a possible situation, Situation and uh, you know I support anything that would uh, uh, further honor our veterans and for and further respect our veterans. I certainly will um, will will consider that. I think maybe Polly, it might need more land space, and that's one of the things that uh, Tim Uggen is working at is trying to get more land space there in the veterans cemetery, but. Um, you know, if, if funding is there, if the congressman really uh, feels that that's uh, something that would uh, be very highly um, feasible, then I'm pretty sure he can use his congressional uh, uh, work and responsibilities to move forward a piece of legislation that would maybe give us appropriations to make sure that that does happen. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Polly. Maureen Maritita. Yes, thank you, Crystal. Um, <clears throat> so, Governor, um, you talked, um, you mentioned digitization so, uh, of the government. So, um, that would include licenses and permits. I know, um, and we've reported that BSP has put out. Um, uh, an uh, RFP um, to digitize that process. Uh, last year, um, the target was December 2021. Do you have um, a new target for that? Will we see it happen this year? I am optimistic it'll happen this year, Maureen, because 
uh, my latest information says that that um, the RFP, I think, is almost done and will be sent out. Okay. Uh, and then... Um, uh, so I'll tell you, can I, I just say, can I just add, Maureen, sure. one of my biggest frustration as governor is bureaucracy. And uh, some of this bureaucracy has to happen because uh, of accountability, you write, and transparency. And I'll tell you, um, if you don't really write the specs just perfectly and dot the I's and cross the T's, uh, it'll be sent back and it'll be have to be redone again. So I'm, I'm saying that because that's some of the reasons of this delay in getting this program, but everybody's on board to get this program. And, you know, we have, uh, we're going to send it to uh, vendors uh, that can come and bid so that, you know, we do actually implement this program. It's going to be great for our economy and for our businesses. Yeah. Yes, it's one of the things that um, every time we report on a new project, uh, we hear about the difficulty of um, the permitting process. Yes. Anyway, um, so uh, I also wanted to ask, um, are you planning um, a state of the island address um, next month? And if so, will it again be um, early in the month? Um, it would probably be around the same time. It's like either the first or second week of the month. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, I can uh, come back round again, but I did have, I have one thing I wanted to clarify on the hospital negotiations, and that was uh, who's negotiating with who? Is that happening in Guam? Is that the yeah. um, the task it is force? Happening. It's happening in Guam, and so GRM and our team are meeting, uh, and our team consists of uh, Gita, um, the, uh, the Office of Military and uh, Department of Land Management is on there. I think Department of Public Works is on there. And so in the, in the uh, Navy, the J JRM, um, they also have their, the uh, commander Perry, who I think is their lead negotiator. Um, and he's in charge of the federal real estate, but you also have Randy Sablon and, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't attend those negotiations. Um, but, uh, they, my team knows exactly, uh, what we want out of this, um, agreement. Okay, I'll, I'll ask more questions when we come round again. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Heidi, any follow-up questions? All right, thank you. Uh, Governor, just a follow-up to Maureen's question. Who is the government of Guam's lead negotiator for this uh, Eagles Field um, negotiation? It's uh, Gita. It's Mel, oh. Mel Manila. Okay. Governor, you mentioned that you uh, you could increase the amount of the LEAP funding because currently it's 50 million. But I think if you calculate the number of applicants to the average um, award, uh, it's not going to be enough. So how much uh, well, do you what think is you calculation? What is your calculation? If it's about, um, wait, let me see. Governor, the three hundred thousand is for the small, uh, large businesses, and fifty thousand for smaller businesses. I think it would. It's already um, the the last figure we had was twelve point one million um, for no. uh, awarded already or provided already. And there's, there's still al a lot there's more. There's already um, 
you know, in terms of awards and in terms of applications that have been approved, we've already reached 51 million. So. So how much more will you uh, provide to this program? Well, Gita and I are talking um, and we're looking at uh, 5 million uh, more, but that hasn't really been um, solidified yet because we're looking at other resources of, of funds, yeah. So if uh, 5 million, so 55 million and you've already um, calculating. My understanding million. is with all the applicants and what was, has been uh, not necessarily written out in sex already, but has been uh, applied and awarded, yeah, 51 million. Thank you, Galvo. Thank you, and uh, one more, um, Governor, who will replace uh, Badi Orsini as director of the Contractors Licensing Board? I know you I named an interim, I an acting one, but who's going to be the uh, replacement? And given what happened and what the OPA procurement decision stated, Will you require all management and staff and board members of the Contractors Licensing Board to do a refresher uh, ethics in government procurement, like prioritize them? So um, we, are, we have already sent out a letter appointing an interim administrator or an interim executive director. And we are looking at several individuals uh, that uh, may, may be the permanent uh, replacement. As far as ethics and um, training and so forth, we require that of all of our cabinet members and board members. So, um, you know, we'll be talking to uh, the board members and if we need to do uh, a refresher, we certainly will. Governor, do you know when they will uh, meet again, the, the CLB? No, I don't. Thank you, Heidi. Joseph Titano, PDN. Thanks, Crystal. Um, Governor, you did have a chance to uh, ask Congress uh, to pass legislation for a binding political status vote. Um, I guess, what was the reaction to that? And uh, what are the possibilities of Congress actually making some effort on that, as you see it? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, they didn't react specifically to my comment, um, but they reacted to Puerto Rico's because, as you know, there's a bill in the legislature uh, for Puerto Rico. And so they had uh, the Puerto Rico uh, Governor Pirillos, I think it's Pirillosi, um, did make that statement very strongly. Um, I wanted to make the statement because I wanted, I really want to uh, move on with our self-determination. And if there's any way that we can work with Congress uh, to make that happen and to um, maybe jump over some of the concerns of previous uh, cases in court, um, uh, I would also work with our uh, Commission on Self-Determination to look at that path. You had mentioned, um, I think it's almost a year ago now that legislation was in the works for a Chamorro, to authorize a Chamorro only plebiscite for Guam, local legislation. Um, is that still going on or are we following up more on the congressional route at this point? I mean, I think, you know, I don't know, uh, Joe, Joe, but uh, you know, the, the speaker, Speaker Terlai is aware of some of the issues of concern during the uh, uh, of the decision of the courts uh, with the Davis case, and if we can work those concerns um, through legislation locally, we certainly will um, work that route. Uh, and if we can do it also through Congress, that would also uh, uh, um, be very helpful. My point is, I'm going to try to use as as many alternative options and options to get that going, yeah. Right, so multiple avenues. Um, as far as a, a possible binding vote, are you still committed to the Chamorro only vote if it was a, a binding a binding plebiscite? When you say binding plebiscite, um, what do you mean? That uh, whatever we ask for will 
because right now what happens is if we have the plebiscite, then uh, whatever. I, I'm sorry, I mean a, a binding on, political they, status vote. Whatever, whatever they decide would have to go to Congress. That's the way the, the law is now written for them to say yes or no. So it's a non-binding um, situation. I think it'd be better if we had a binding one. Right. Uh, yeah, but, but you know, even if we had a binding, binding, binding vote. Sorry, go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry, Governor. No, I did mean to ask, not in the, the local plebiscite. I mean, if their legislation were to be passed through Congress or any other route, would you still support uh, the Chamorro only uh, binding vote? Yes. All right, good to hear. And then, uh, what, all right, I'm sorry, if I could just sneak one in. Uh, I know you had a chance to meet with the Treasury. Um, we're looking for a possible EITC reimbursement for tax year 2020. Um, is there any word about that coming down the pipe? Um. I didn't this time around. Uh, I know Daphne's on top of this to make sure that we start getting them. I think she said we would get them for fiscal year 2020 filings. Yeah. Okay, understood. All right, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Last but not least, Aurora Khan, Pacific Island Times. Yes, hi, Governor, again. Uh, so my uh, question is about the uh, compact uh, you, you mentioned that during your speech, you before the Senator Manchin's uh, committee, you uh, asked for the ability for Guam to participate in the negotiations for uh, the new compact. What do you think are the prospects of that happening? I think the prospects for that uh, is probably very slim because we're not uh, an independent country. And we're under the U.S. territory, and the negotiator for that is the Department of Interior. Uh, and in the past, I have asked the Department of Interior to participate in maybe just an observer position, uh, but we were not allowed to, but we were allowed to submit what our concerns and our issues and what our suggestions for amendments into the compact of, of uh, free association agreement. Um, so, but even if it's slim, I am continue, I will continue to make the case that it's important that Guam, which is, which is the island that's uh, you know, much more significantly impacted by the migration of our brothers and sisters across the island, uh, neighbors, um, then I will continue to do that. Uh, only, I mean, I think it's only reasonable because uh, we are the most significantly impacted. And, uh, you know, for me, I think it'd be uh, wise to uh, hear from those areas that are impacted and how maybe we can work together to still get the same uh, results, but um, cooperate in making sure to mitigate the impact of it in a satisfactory way. They did ask us if 30 million was enough. And I said, absolutely not. You know, 30 million is carved out with all the state, I mean, all the, the territories. And that's not enough for the uh, expenses that we incur as a result of the migrants. And I, I want to be very clear that, you know, we as an island nation, I mean, uh, an island um, community is very, very uh, welcoming. And we welcome our brothers and sisters to help them in whatever way we can through uh, to make their lives better. For example, education and in work uh, opportunities. Um, but we also feel that we need to be um, reimbursed for those expenses so we can also continue uh, providing services for everyone in our island in a much more uh, adequate way. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Aurora. We're running out of time. I'm going to go back around real quick. If you have any outstanding questions, Nestor, any last uh, questions? No, I think we've covered pretty much everything I'm interested in. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time, Governor. Thank you, Nestor. Thank Polly Sespa? Yes, uh, real quick, um, with uh, Admiral Nicholson talking about the MDA looking at Eagles Field and whatnot, and then you're saying that uh, Eagles Field is very much still on the table for the hospital. So. 
you're basically saying that uh, they can coexist right next to each other, a missile defense system and a hospital? No, what, what, what I'm saying is that the uh, carved out portion of uh, Eagles Field um, is still there for us. They are looking at adjacent to that because they are, you know, at one time, Polly, that was all also a radar communications area. Um, and they're looking at uh, something like that for the missile defense. You know, they're not building the missile defense base right there. They're looking at various sites for communication, radar, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, but they need to make their survey to make sure uh, that that site doesn't impact on the airport and also does not impact on the hospital functions. Understood. And then last one, uh, in the, with the Department of Interior, they say that about $25 million could help provide broadband coverage across Guam, including providing access to the, to at least 51,000 Guam residents. Are we, if we provide internet access for, uh, low income families, is it going to be it, the internet service that is going to be provided? Is there going to be some kind of sanctions on those? Or is it a free no. for all? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, maybe I'm not understanding what you mean by sanction. Uh, basically, by basically paying attention and, and making sure that uh, they're using the internet service for only specific needs and wants since it's going to be uh, uh, provided freely. No, it's going to be able to access internet for their daily business and daily lives. Yeah. Understood. Thank you so much. Okay. Maureen Maritita, any last questions? Um, just uh, about the hospital. Um, so do you still plan uh, if DOI pays for um, uh, the charrette by the Army Corps of Engineers, do you still plan to take up that offer? Because as I remember, it would take several years. And I don't know if um, I get the feeling you'd like to get this done pretty quickly. So that would be quite some delay. Um, yeah. And then also, could you address the issue of the um, landowners um, or those who, who have identified as landowners, whether there will be some sort of um, accommodation or compensation? Right. So first with the hospital, um, uh, Maureen, it, uh, with the hospital in terms of the planning charade, um, they are, we have already uh, contracted a, uh, a vendor that can help do that. And so when I was meeting with the Army Corps of Engineers, there was discussion about let's look at what this vendor will be doing with uh, the planning charrette uh, and it's going to be almost like the same that they're going to be that the army corps of engineers is going to be doing so i don't want repetition and redundancy uh, of doing the same thing so we're we're talking uh to see how they can uh, align and also uh, help support uh, the, the planning, the architectural design and the construction. Is that an on-island vendor, ma'am? It's, uh, uh, no, it's an off-island vendor, yeah. Okay, all right. And so your question, what, what was the other question? Um, oh, the landowners, the yeah. Yes. So I made the statement earlier that, um, you know, the, the piece of property that is being looked at is uh, in the federal government's asset inventory. It's not excess land. They're not returning it to the government of Guam. They are allowing the government of Guam through a lease program uh, to build a medical complex. If they don't build a medical complex, then um, they return it, we return it back to the federal government. So that's very clear. It's not returned to the government of Guam. Uh, there are other situations that that also has happened here. Um, as far as the landowners, I do plan to meet with the landowners. 
um, and, you know, get an idea of what it is that they're looking at. Uh, I do know, Maureen, that currently there's a land claims fund. Uh, and that land claims fund is a fund for the purpose of compensating landowners for properties that, that, that they can never get back. Um, that I think needs to have much more money in there. I think there's 15 million in there. So this is the legislative issue. The legislature needs to look at that and see if they can appropriate more monies into that land fund bank so that uh, owners can feel that they're compensated for property that will never be returned. Now, I do know that some of the owners uh, have been compensated for their land. And that's why I wanted to meet with them along, I think with uh, the, the director of land management to just kind of clarify exactly uh, you know, what is, what is, what is it that uh, is being uh, discussed and what is it that uh, their, their issues and what is it that they're looking at, looking for. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maureen, and thank you to the rest of our media. Is the vendor only dealing with planning, not uh, design, build? Right, yeah, okay. the, the contract was only for, for planning. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so All much, right. Ma Maureen. And thank you for getting that clarification. Uh, this will end our news briefing today. If you have any, you can go ahead and direct your outstanding questions to me.